So, good morning and welcome everyone uh, to this uh, opening of the new academic year for the PhD student at CIMEC. So, we welcome the 31st cycle of PhD students uh, at CIMEC that started um, uh, on the 1st of November. Um, I have the great pleasure and honor to introduce today Professor John Duncan. Professor John Duncan um, did his undergraduate and doctorate work at the University of Oxford and then moved uh, to the University of Oregon, the US, to work for two years uh, as a postdoc. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, during that period, he published uh, one of the first and most influential work on object-based attention that has uh, not only made it to every textbook, but has influenced uh, our research on object-based attention in the subsequent years. Uh, then he came back from the US and uh, uh, took a research position at the Medical Research Council in what was at that time the uh, Applied Psychology Unit, so the APU. The APU, many of you probably know it, is uh, uh, in the history of cognitive psychology as one of the most influential places in, in the UK and throughout Europe for cognitive psychology. Um, the APU has now changed name, so it's called now the Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit, uh, and it's, it's still an MRC unit, and uh, uh, Professor Duncan is now um, Assistant Director of the unit. He holds uh, joint appointment, appointments as a program leader at the MRC Cognitive Brain Science Unit in Cambridge, and he is also a professional research fellow in the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford. Um, he returned to the US uh, at a certain point and uh, uh, worked in collaboration with uh, Bob Desimon, and to my understanding that was uh, a new start also, uh, because uh, from that experience, he uh, also oriented his research towards uh, neurophysiology. Uh, I think it also uh, originates from that experience another hugely influential work, uh, that is the work uh, on the so-called bias competition theory that was published in uh, 95, together with Bob Desimon. Uh, I cannot list all the influential work that uh, John has uh, made over the years. Uh, John has now been made fellow of the British Royal Society and of the British Academy. In 2012, he received the, from the no, uh, Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences the Heineken Prize for Cognitive Science, uh, Cognitive Science. and uh, he works on many different uh, approaches and there are many different things, but the core of what he does uh, he is and always been, I think, um, the study of attention, intelligence, and cognitive control. That he studies with very di different approaches going from cognitive psychology, neuropsychology, neuroimaging, single cell physiology uh, in humans and uh, other animals, in particular monkeys. In 2010, uh, I I had the opportunity to read uh, his book that is called How Intelligence Happens. And to put it briefly, the way I think about mind and brain after reading that book is radically different from the way I thought about mind and brain before reading that book. Now, that might tell a lot about my ignorance, uh, but at the same time, it was definitely a paradigmatic shift for me in the way I should think about uh, the whole mind-brain system. So please welcome me me, uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor John Duncan today. Well, thank you very much, Francesco. Um, I'm also delighted and honored to be here. Uh, great affection for Rovereto and indeed for this building. Am I giving? Yeah, it's probably better. Um, yes, I'm very pleased to be to, uh, uh, here today, and in particular in the presence of Francesco Pavani, as far as I know, one of the very <laughs> handful of people to read my book, and certainly an even smaller handful of people to enjoy my book. So this is really a special treat for me. Um, I have a strong tendency when I'm giving talks on topics that I get excited about to go faster and faster and faster and faster, 
and uh, especially in an audience of non-native English speakers, that's a serious mistake. Uh, but I don't always know that I'm doing it. So will you please, uh, if you detect this, put your hands up and slow me down. We've just been told we have plenty of time, so uh, there's no need for me to rush through to the end, and I would much prefer to be interrupted than I would to feel that I am spouting to an audience who have long ago stopped listening to me because they've got no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to talk about both cognitive and brain mechanisms of human intelligence. Uh, here is the cover of the book, as I say. If you buy it, you'll, be, you'll join an exclusive special international club of people who've done that. Um, but uh, to, to begin, of course, it's true that human intelligence, the human mind, has become you know, arguably the, but certainly one of the, most, one of the most powerful, potent forces on Earth, putting absolutely everything that you see in your world around you onto the face of our globe. Here are some examples, skylines, microchips, huge cornfields, but just look around you. There's absolutely nothing you can see right now besides our own bodies that weren't put here by human intelligence and even our own bodies very much affected by that. Go to the window and look outside again, your entire environment. This is the power that is, that is making our world the way that it is. We understand little to nothing about how this actually happens. So this makes it one of the most important and exciting scientific challenges we have, and one that we are working on, but I can't say you feel that we've made massive progress to this, to this um, point. And in the study of mind and brain, the question of intelligence can be addressed and should be addressed at multiple different levels. There's the sort of 100-year-old and high and sort of troubled history of so-called intelligence testing, whatever that means. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, there's the very early work in artificial intelligence in trying to design computers that think. Fascinating that even very early on in this enterprise in the 1950s, when computers really were just first becoming available, that the study of things that we regard as highly intelligent, such as making proofs in symbolic logic, seemed to come very naturally even to the first computers, and they seem to do it in a way that's very much like the way that undergraduates do it, uh, even though computers are so have been until very recently conspicuously bad at everything else. This seems to be an interesting lead as well. And then, of course, you've got the thought that in a brain composed of billions and billions of tiny little processing units or neurons, that somehow they collaborate with one another to produce what we see up here. So this is also an interesting level of analysis. But I'm going to begin with um, the study of so-called intelligence testing, of the study of individual differences in human cognition, and what I think is one of the sort of core um, discoveries of experimental psychology and how we might think about explaining it. Uh, this comes from the work of Spearman at the beginning of the 20th century. As I say, one of the great psychological principles. This is one of the few things that in psychology you can write, you can write down as a strong regularity of fact and say that this applies very generally. And it's illustrated here with plots of various different results you might get if you look at the relationship or the correlation between measures of two different ability on two different psychological tests. Let's call them X and Y because the great psychological principle is it doesn't matter what X and Y are, the result is always the same. So what would happen here, you've plotted you've, the performance of a whole load of different individuals, each individual is a dot, on test X and test Y, and we measure whether or not doing well on X predicts how you will do on Y. This is one possible result. Perfect circular plot showing no relationship between the two or a correlation of zero. When you measure how well a person does on X, it tells you nothing about how well they'll do on Y. In laboratory testing, that never happens. Here's another possibility. Perfect this is a correlation of one, and it means that when you measure how well a person does X, you can tell exactly what they will do on Y. Uh, again, a possible result in the laboratory, that never has ever, ever happens. You'll never see anything like this. Now here is some form of positive correlation, which means that people who do better on X in general tend to do better on Y, though of course there's a lot of slop around the prediction line that you might draw through the two. So measuring X doesn't tell you exactly how well somebody will do on Y, but overall on average it tends to be true that people who are better on X also tend to do better on Y. Um, and finally, there's the, uh, there's the possibility that it would go the other way, that people who do better on X do worse on Y, also never observed in real life. In real life, every observation looks like this. Uh, the exact extent of the correlation varies from one pair of tests to another, 
tip, if you measure a good wide population of individuals, the lowest correlations are typically in the range of 0.2 or so, the highest are in the range of 0.6 or so, but it's some variation of this pattern. But the better people do on one thing, the better they do on another. As I say, it was Spearman in 1904 who first established the methods and then did the experiments to show that this was true, but it's been replicated many hundreds of times since. How might you explain this universal positive correlation? There are quite a few possible explanations you could think of. Probably many of them have an element of truth in them, but Spearman put forward perhaps the simplest idea you might think of. And that was that could it be that there's some internal, he called it a factor, but we might think of it as a cognitive process or a property of the brain, we might think of it in different ways, but there's some common process that's important in being successful in all manner of different activities. It doesn't matter what you're trying, there's this common factor in your mind or brain that at least makes a contribution to being successful. And because he had no idea what it might be, in either brain terms or mind terms, he just called it G for a general factor. Uh, and as I say, in modern terms, you might think of G as being some particular cognitive function. That's important in all sorts of different activities. Or you might think of it as some particular aspect of brain function that's important in all sorts of different activities. And if there really is something general of that sort, it would at least be a part of, explana of the explanation for why positive correlations are always seen. One reason that makes me feel attracted to this explanation is the following observation. If you believe, the, if, you, if you follow this, um, so believe, but if you follow Spearman's idea of some common factor or G factor, then it's easy to work out which psychological tests seem to be most, in, most um, dependent on that factor. And in simple terms, these are the tests which most broadly and, and widely predict success on other things. And when you use that criterion to say which tests seem to be most, the best measures of this hypothetical general or G factor, then they turn out to be problem-solving tasks, sort of reasonably simple puzzle-type problem-solving tasks. So this will do better than, shall we say, a reaction time test, where you just press a button as fast as you can, or a short-term memory test. Problem-solving seems to be the best way to, get, to measure one thing, and then it gives you broad prediction of how well people do on all sorts of other things. Here's one example. You're supposed to work out which of these response alternatives completes the matrix. Here's another one. You're supposed to find this simple figure camouflaged somewhere in this background. Here's an arithmetical example where you've got a series 1, 2, 5, 26, and you're supposed to work out which is the next number in the series. I know you'll all be puzzling about this one because the others are much easier to solve than this one is. But anyway, Simple, fairly simple problem solving with materials that, you, that are not particularly complicated or require too much in the way of special education turn out to be tests that have this property of broad universal positive correlation of success in other things. And this seems to me to be like a flag in the sand telling you something. This is important. If you stop to think about it, it's kind of incredible that you measure how well somebody does this spatial problem solving. It seems unrelated to most of the things that you do in everyday life. And yet, it's a pretty good predictor, not only of how well you'll do other experimental tasks, but even better predictor of, for example, how well you'll do in your education or what your final salary will be. So whatever is going on in this test, it seems to be something it would be really good to, to understand psychologically. And in experimental psychology, Generally speaking, it's kind of hard to know which of the infinite variety of things that we could work on in cognition and behavior we actually are actually worth working on. This, to me, is a pretty strong point to saying, this is worth working on, because whatever it is that's measured in tests of this sort, it's something that's really important. So what is it? Um, I'm going to go through various um, lines of, experiment, of, of work that uh, lead to my idea about what we're measuring in tests of this sort. And the first thought is the following. It doesn't have to be true, but it could easily be true, that if Spearman's idea is right, if we're talking about some general or G factor important, important in all sorts of different tasks, then you might be able to see that in brain imaging experiments. So in brain imaging, for example, with functional MRI, usually experiments are designed with the idea of modularity in the brain. In other words, you're looking for brain systems that are associated 
with some specific cognitive function of interest in your, to you, the experiment. You might design an experiment to look at memory or language or face recognition or whatever, looking for modules in the brain that are specifically related to memory or language or, brain or face recognition. Um, there are an awful lot of that has been done over the last 20 years, and it's very successful re revealing this, you know, to, to a degree, specialization of modules for different functions, such as face recognition. But what I'm going to talk about now is a complementary discovery, the idea that um, is, seems more reminiscent of Spearman's G concept, that is a brain system that seems to be a part of the brain's response to many, many different kinds of cognitive challenge, suggesting something in common in the way the brain addresses different kinds of cognitive problems. So here, this could be shown by um, looking at experimental results from many, many different laboratories, but here's one example of our own that came out a couple of years ago. Um, where we, we wanted to address the question at the level of, of the brains of individual subjects in a brain imaging experiment. So what we did was to use seven different tasks. The first one we call a localizer task. Uh, and in the localizer task, the sub each, on each trial, the subject got a sequence of either non-words or a sequence of words making up a sentence. And then they have a short-term memory test at the end. They have to say which of these two items was present in the previous sequence. So by looking in the brain of an individual subject at um, regions, uh, regions, voxels, if you like, that are more active, in, we can either look at ones that are more active in the, the condition that's more cognitively demanding, which is the series of non-words. Obviously, that's much harder to do. Or we can look at voxels that are more interested in language, which presumably will be more responsive in, in the sentence condition. So that was the idea, to use this task to identify those two sets of voxels in individual subjects' brains, either the demand-related ones or the language-related ones. And then we saw how those same voxels behaved in six other tasks, each of which came in a more demanding or a less demanding version. So there was an arithmetic, arithmetic task that was either easy, because you didn't have, these numbers you had to add were simple, or more difficult. There was a spatial short-term memory task. You have to remember this series of blocks and then say what they add up to at the end. Again, an easy version with few blocks in each presentation or a more difficult version. Um, this is a verbal working memory task, again, easy or hard. And then various versions of response competition tasks. The details don't really matter. In fact, the whole point of this experiment is, remember only this, the details don't matter because whatever experiment you do, you get the same results. But here are various response competition tasks based on variants of the Stroop, and one of them actually was a Stroop task, which I expect you're all familiar with. So what we're going to do is define voxels in individual brains from the contrasts between these two tasks and then see how they respond in, each of the, in the easier and more difficult versions of each of the other six tasks. The top part of this figure shows example results for 12 of the different participants in this experiment. Uh, the results are shown on the left hemisphere because the language selective voxels tend to be much better established in the left hemisphere. The non-word or demand selective voxels are much better uh, bilateral. So the bluish ones are voxels that in the brains of individual subjects responded more strongly to non-words than to sentences. The pink ones responded more strongly to sentences than non-words. The first thing to see is just how tightly abutted these can be to one, to one another in the brains of individual subjects, especially in the frontal lobe, well, frontal and parietal lobe. But here's an example subject where you've got a whole language selective area in left frontal cortex, very reminiscent of the idea of Broca's area, which is one of the keystones of neuropsychology, but immediately surrounded by the sort of upside down V of brain regions that instead respond more strongly to the non-words, to the more demanding condition. Um, so right next not door to one another in the frontal lobe and something similar also in the parietal lobe, you find regions in individual brains with completely opposite response properties, some that are very interested in language and some that are more responsive to the more demanding version of the two tasks. And then the rest of this slide is too small to see in detail, but again, I don't think it matters much because only the big picture really, the big picture is so simple. So over here, what we've done is to take the pink regions in each subject, we've divided them up into, or, into um, broad categories depending on their anatomical position in the brain. Um, we've shown they have stronger response to the language than to the non-words, to the sentences than to the non-words by definition. And then in the rest of this, we plot how they respond to all the other tasks in the easy and the difficult versions. And the summary is 
in none of these regions is the, do the other tasks drive much of a response and certainly what they don't do is to have a stronger response for the more difficult compared with the more easy. So these seem like language selective regions and you'll see a very, as you expect, language system with this region in Broca's area and then a whole stretch of, of left temporal going up into left parietal lobe. So that's kind of the modular result. Now what happens with the blue areas, the ones that responded more strongly to the non-words? Now you see an awful lot of columns above zero. It's they, these regions respond to all the other tasks, and they always respond more strongly to the difficult version than they do to the easy version, the difficult version being the solid bar. As I say, don't try and scrutinize the actual graph, um, but for almost all these regions, again, divided up into different anatomical chunks, that's the truth, that in the brains of individual subjects, if a voxel likes the non-words more than the sentences, it also responds more strongly to the more demanding compared to the less demanding version of all the other tasks, whatever they are. And of course, we pick these tasks pretty randomly. We know perfectly well we could have chosen many other tasks and got the same result. That uh, means that it makes sense to simply average the brain's response to the, more, to the more demanding minus less demanding contrast across all these different domains or contents. And if you do that and average the results, then you end up with this, what I call the canonical MD or multiple demand pattern. I call it multiple demand because that's what it is. These are regions of the brain that do have this property of increased response no matter what cognitive challenge you throw at the subject. And it has this rather characteristic pattern of an upside down V, as I was hinting at before, on the lateral surface of the frontal lobe. So here's the brain looking on the lateral surface from the outside in. Here's the medial surface where we've cut the two hemispheres apart and we're looking at the inside edge of one hemisphere. So on the lateral frontal sur surface, you've got this upside down V going here from an area that's buried in the lateral sulcus here in the anterior insula, going up through a region often called the inferior frontal junction to premotor cortex, and then along the inferior frontal sulcus. Uh, in the medial surface, always accompanied by this activity in the, called the dorsal anterior cingulate and the pre-supplementary motor area, but generally accompanying this, and accompanied also by this activity along the intraparietal sulcus in the parietal lobe. At least in visual tasks, you will generally get this higher visual activity as well, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm just focusing on these frontal and parietal components of the multiple demand or MD system. So this is obviously reminiscent of Spearman's idea. The idea of G was some factor, some abstract unknown factor, which is involved in organizing all kinds of different performance. And now we find with fMRI, that indeed there is this very anatomically consistent multiple demand pattern, some system or network, which seems to be a part of the brain's response to solving all kinds of different challenges. I've listed some of them here, but if you look at the literature more broadly, the list is essentially endless, um, limited only by the imagination of psychologists in devising new ways to challenge the mind and brain. And a couple of other things, I mean, on the surface, on the face of it, it seems as if that MD result has a lot in common with the idea of, the idea of a G factor, a general factor. And if you try to test that directly, there's various other lines of evidence support it. Here's an early experiment that we did where we used fMRI to try and distinguish typical problem solving. Here you're supposed to which is, work out which is the odd one out, and this is, again, based on an adaptation of a standard fluid intelligence test of the sort I've been talking about. And you compare that with what happens in a simple sensory motor control. We also have to find the odd one out, but there isn't any problem solving involved because the task is trivial. And if you make a contrast of that sort, um, you see a picture of the multiple demand system that's more or less indistinguishable from the one I showed you before, derived in a completely um, uh, independent way. Uh, this is only partial, of course, because only any one experiment only ever shows you a part of, of, what you, of what's really there because of low power in fMRI. But if you look across experiments, you can see, again, you're going to get something that's very much like the same multiple demand pattern that I talked about before. We've also looked at this using neuropsychology, that is, the effects of brain damage, because the prediction would be that if you measure um, the loss of um, so those tests of problem solving, sorry, I just slipped this in without explaining. In the psychometric literature, they're often called fluid intelligence tests. Um, never mind why, that's just the name that they're often given. But if you measure a loss of fluid intelligence tests like this after brain damage, uh, 
So here's an experiment with 80 patients with damage. The co colors in the gold, golden colors show where the overlap was between lesion locations in this eight group of 80 subjects. So we've, just to show we've covered really much of the, of the cortex by sampling pretty broadly where people's brain damage was. And then these regions outline the multiple demand regions independently uh, identified from previous fMRI results. So now we can ask how much the, and in each patient we measure their fluid intelligence and we get an estimate of what it was probably like before the lesion based on a couple of predictors of things that don't change much when, uh, when um, the brain is damaged. And here we plot the loss of fluid intelligence, so a lower score is bad as a function of the volume of damage in ind individual patients in these a priori multiple demand regions. And you see a reasonable relationship between the two. Um, the slop around this line is still substantial and it remains you know, one of the massive fascinating mysteries of neuropsychology. Why is it that two people with apparently similar brain damage end up with wildly different cognitive outcomes and there's not much still that we can say about that. But still, the prediction of fluid intelligence loss from volume of multiple demand damage was um, quite strong in this sample, whereas damage outside the multiple demand system was not predictive at all. So it again tends to cement this idea that what we're looking at here is some sort of core system that not only is important in many different tasks, but also is a core part of what you're measuring in these fluid intelligence tests. Um, so that gets us to the point of defining the system. Now we would like to say something about what that system actually does in computational or cognitive terms. So let's think about that a little bit. Um, and a good place to start is with the neuropsychology of patients who have had substantial damage to frontal cortex, frontal lobe patients. And the summary, and this has been known since the 19th century, um, my favorite by far per working on this is Luria, who has the most beautiful descriptions and analyses of, of, of the behavioral disorganization that can follow frontal lobe damage. And I would summarize the overall picture as follows. What you see is not so much a loss of a particular fragment or element of cognition. So the patient may still be able to um, speak fine, they can see fine, they can control the body, the movements of their body, um, they seem to be laying down new memories and so on. But somehow, all the different fragments that go together to make an effective piece of behavior um, don't, get, don't get put together in the right way. So behavior seems disorganized and ineffective. Um, if you think about what you do all day, every day, you have to accumulate a whole structure of part, component parts of behavior and cognition, one after the other, that allow you to get from your start state to your goal state. Just think about everything you've had to do to make sure that you're sitting here listening to me today. Um, and in frontal lobe patients, that structure tends to become disorganized or broken. For example, that some completely irrelevant part gets stuck into a sequence of behavior, even though it's got nothing to do with the goal that the person is apparently pursuing. Or some absolutely critical part gets left out so that the whole structure no longer has any chance of achieving its goals. Um, here's an example from Luria. I put it in because it's... Um, because it's it's kind of striking. Uh, the patient first has to draw a circle. He does so successfully. Then he's asked to draw a minus sign. Step one, the patient draws this horizontal thing here. One of the things that Luria emphasized a lot in frontal lobe patients was the perseveration at multiple levels, a tendency to carry over from one bit of behavior into the current, the, something from previous behavior into the current behavior, even though it's not appropriate anymore. And Luria ascribes this drawing like this to being perseveration of the tendency to draw outline figures. Whether, I don't know whether that's right or not. Then the patient perseverated a bit more and drew this circle around, and then he wrote underneath, no entry. So you won't typically see anything this extreme if you're just testing frontal lobe patients in the clinic. Um, this will really only happen with somebody either with a very big lesion or with a frontal lobe lesion accompanied by some other um, broader challenge to their health. But I think it's kind of a caricature of the disorganization and irrelevance and chaos of, that can follow from large frontal lobe lesions. And here's um, Luria's, one of Luria's many summaries of what a frontal lobe um, lesion does to your behavior. The plan of actions involving the patient's intentions quickly loses its regulating influence on behavior as a whole, 
and is replaced by perseverations of one particular link of the motor act, as we saw up here, or by influence of some connection established during the patient's past experience, as you see here, by writing no entry completely irrelevantly. All he's been asked to do is write a minus sign. This form of disturbance of the system of selective goal-directed actions, their replacement by inert motor stereotypes or fragmentary irrelevant connections may be detected in many patients with a frontal lobe lesion. So I think this is the behavioral and cognitive picture that we are trying to understand. Uh, how should we think about that in terms of underlying cognitive mechanisms? Um, and my suggestion is that we shouldn't go too far away from this picture in itself. Uh, and this, this, is my, this is my outline suggestion about how we should think about this problem and therefore how we should think about the functions of the multiple demand system. And it begins with what I just was outlining to you, that all day, every day, to structure our behavior, we do something so effortlessly, we're not really aware of doing it. And that is to build an incredibly complicated and substantial structure of component fragments of thought and cognition. And we have to, this, the components of this, of this structure have to be run off one after the other. And if we keep this whole structure nice and tight and do all the bits, then it moves us from the start state that we began with to the goal state that we're trying to achieve. Why does it have to be that way? This was worked on a, a lot in early artificial intelligence, symbolic artificial intelligence, as I was referring to in my first slide. And they first worked out when trying to write programs to solve problems that it was simply impossible to ever solve a problem, a typical complex problem of our lives in one step. Um, let me give you, I won't go through the work, I'll just give you a feeling for this with the following example. You can't think, I want to go to Roboreto and give a talk, what do I do with my left hand? Because there just aren't enough constraints from the way that you have posed the problem at that point to tell you what to do with your left hand. But what you can do is set the sub-goal of flying, set the sub-goal of buying a ticket, set the sub-goal of logging into the internet, and now if your laptop's in front of you, you do know what to do with your left hand. So this is what we do all day, every day, and it has to be this way, that we find a way to solve complex problems by dividing them into a massive structure, often called sub-goal sub goal, sub structure, of simpler, more solvable parts, until finally we get down to the level of, of problems that we can actually, will actually tell us how to move our bodies and interact with the world. Um, you might think of this then as creating a um, structure, a large series of attentional episodes, of episodes of cognition, where you focus on one small part of the problem after another, and when you put all these episodes together, you get from your start state to your goal state. Here's an example from some early AI work, reasonably early AI, AI work by Sakadoti in 1974, and I like to present this example because it captures so well what you'll often read of frontal lobe patients in the clinical literature. So Sakadoti was, trying, was writing the control program for an early robot that inhabited this world of multiple rooms and blocks in different positions in the rooms. And as in all problem solving, it was, the robot was given a start state where he's physically in this room at the moment, um, and then a goal state where he's supposed to end up in this room, and meanwhile he should have gone into this room and pushed these two blocks together. So that's the sort of problem that the robot was having to solve. And Sakadoti wrote the control program in two different styles. In one style, there was really no encouragement to do this division into goal, sub-goal, um, control things by goal, sub-goal division. And then, here's the path the robot takes through the whole space of possible moves he might go through in this room. And eventually, he does get to his goal state down here from his start state up here, but only after chaotically exploring a whole load of things that seem completely irrelevant to getting him closer to where he's trying to go. Now, the, in this version, the control architecture is written to encourage this breaking down into goals by sub-goals to shape uh, goals and sub-goals to shape the activity. For example, here, the first sub-goal selected might be to get to the door of this room, and then everything is done simply trying to work out what gets closer to the door rather than all the other constraints of the problem. And now, as Sakadoti said, it's as if the, pro the robot was given a series of small problems, each of which he's got the power to solve nice and directly, instead of one massively complicated problem, and then you get this beautiful straight path from the start state to the goal state. And if you read the clinical literature on frontal lobe patients, this sounds very, very familiar, because what is constantly said is that if, there are, if the situation is very constrained, 
for example, the testing, test, um, doing a clinical neuropsychological test, the patient will often do very well. And then when they go back out of the clinic into the outside world, where, um, where it's all much less constrained and they have to do more shaping of the problem for themselves, then chaos breaks loose and the person has enormous trouble going back to work, keeping up thing, relationships in their family and so on. They can do well on small constrained problems. What they can't do well is taking something complicated and break it down into an effective structure of small problems of their own. Um, and this, in a way, seems um, consistent with the fact that, if we go back to Spearman's G, that the, the tasks, as I said at the beginning, that best measure this overall ability to do well on different tasks in the lab and in the outside world requires relatively complicated tests of this sort. As I say, if you just measure how quickly how, a person's speed of cognition, for example, by asking them to press one of two buttons as fast as they can when one of two stimuli appears, that has some positive correlation with other tasks, but nothing like as much as these problem-solving tests. Or if you may use a short-term memory test to see how many items somebody can keep in, in their digit, what their digit span is, some positive correlation, but nothing like what you get with these relatively more complicated tests. And it seems sensible to think that what you're loading by making tests a little bit more complicated like this is this ability to focus on one part or another and build an overall solution out of these component parts. For example, when you look at this test, um, you better think to yourself something along the lines of, I'll, do, I'll solve the problem of shape. I'll solve the problem of color. I'll solve the problem of size. And if you think of all of those, then you end up at the right answer. And if you leave any of those components out, then you end up with choosing one of the others. And here, this is the case where you're supposed to find this simple shape hidden in the camouflaging background. People who do badly on this test are staggeringly bad at it. Um, years ago, I used a version where each problem, you're given a maximum of three minutes. And it's not rare to find subjects, again, if you test people across the whole, whole um, range of, 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 um, of uh, cognitive ability in the, in the normal human population, you'll find quite a few people who every single, single problem, they just sit there for three minutes and don't come up with the answer. How does that happen? Well, it seems very plausible to me to, that if you just wait for this whole thing to pop out at you, it won't because you've been, the items have been devised to make sure that doesn't happen. But when I solve it, I know what I do, which is that I think something along the lines of, OK, let's see if I can find this angle. And then you go and find a place where you can find that angle. And then you say, can I build this bit? No, I can't. So I'll find another place where I can find that angle, uh, and so on and so forth. And if you do that, pretty soon you'll find a place where the whole where the whole um, shape it can, can, be, can be constructed. So in both of these cases, it seems very plausible a priori that what you're really measuring is this ability to take something that's relatively complex and divide it into simple parts that are more easily solved. And I think that has a reasonably um, close relationship to our everyday intuition about what happens when problems are solved more or less intelligently. That is, we associate the more intelligent solution, if you like, with having a clear mind and focus, with having bearing in mind at any given time only that exact information that you need to solve this little bit of what you're doing and being able to keep everything else away. So it's a priori seems like a plausible story about, about tests of this sort. I'm just going to briefly go through an experiment that tests that idea against another alternative. Because one of the most popular things in ways that cognitive psychology has come up with for thinking about fluid intelligence is in terms of working memory demand. And even though it's true that a very simple short-term memory test doesn't measure fluid intelligence especially well, the thought is something along the following lines. When you're solving a problem of this sort, but to choose the final answer, you have to integrate your solutions to all these different parts of the problem. And that means that as you're working on one of them, for example, the color, you also have to be keeping in working memory the solution that you had for another one, for example, the shape. And then at the end, you have to get all this information organized in working memory and put it together to get, choose the final answer from the response alternatives. So we decided in the next experiment, it's a very simple-minded experiment, but the results are pretty telling, to eliminate that whole requirement, to get rid of the working memory element, and thus basically design a matrix task of, like this one that's completely trivial once you have found a way to divide it into these attentional episodes dealing with one component after another. So this is what it worked. 
Again, there was a how it worked. Again, there was a matrix at the top, a dotted empty box that you were supposed to fill in. And this time, we just asked them to draw their answer, draw the ele element that should fit in there. Um, in other words, rather than choosing be between response alternatives. And in fact, these elements in these matrices were always constructed of three different parts. So once you found each part, you had to just draw in the answer and for that part and then proceed to the next. So for example, you might focus on the right-hand side, uh, decide, looking at this, that it should be curved, and then you can draw in the curve. So there's no need to keep everything in mind at once here. Then you might focus on the top, decide it should be filled, draw in a filled top, then finally, the left-hand side, decide that it should have an angle, draw in the angle. Um, whoa, what did I do? Backwards. Um, and you finished the answer. So, as, we, as you see, once you've focused attention on one part of this figure after another, it seems completely trivial. The component problems are completely easy. Um, yet, would it behave like this conventional fluid intelligence test? And the answer is absolutely. So what we have done is to take, here there are 40 subjects, uh, these are the performance of each of them. On our new test, this is the number correct out of 10. They're given 30 seconds to solve each item. Uh, so this is the number they got right in 30, sec uh, 30 seconds per item out of 10, plotted against how they perform on a standard fluid intelligence test measured with something it's called the culture fair. I'm sure it's not culture fair, but this is the name it's had since the early 1950s. But it's a test like the ones I was showing you, including matrices, odd one out, that sort of, sort of standard psychometric test of fluid intelligence. And you can see our new test, despite getting rid of this need to integrate all the different components, behaves in exactly the same way. But for people who do, so 100 would mean the median score in the normal population, people who are much above 100 or 110 on this test tend to get almost all of our ma new matrix items correct. People who are down in the lower half of the distribution, especially once you get much below 90, which is only less than a standard deviation below the median in the normal population, they can't do our test at all, uh, at least not in 30 seconds. I said that our test only really becomes trivial once you've focused on one part after another. Is that really true? Well, here's another condition of the experiment where we made that requirement, we solved that requirement for people in just the same way that you feel when you're clinically testing a frontal lobe patient, you solve their problem for them by focusing exactly on what they're supposed to do moment by moment. So what we now did was to present the same or the same structure of problems, but in three different chunks. So again, they're supposed to look over here, decide it should be curved and draw a curve. Look at the middle one, decide it should be solid and draw a solid. Look at the one on the other, on the, look at the last one, um, decide that it should be kinked and draw that. So it's the same problem, but now with this way of finding the division into parts solved for the person, if you like. Um, again, 30 seconds for each of the items of this sort. Now, you can probably guess the blue dots are what you saw before, the red dots are the new condition. So now, even the people who do very badly on the standard fluid intelligence test are able to solve nearly all of these problems perfectly pretty strongly saying that indeed it's true that what tasks of this sort are focusing on is this need to take something complicated and find a way to divide it into a structure of simpler attentional episodes dealing with one part after another and combining them so that the overall goal is achieved. Right. Um, how am I doing for time? More or less correctly, I think. Uh, I've gone over a lot. I um, apologize again if I've gone over it um, faster than I should have done, but I'm just going to finish with two little indications of how you can take these psychological ideas and turn them more into physiology. That is how we can begin to look at the multiple demand system and ask whether or not it is indeed carrying out this function of defining focused attentional episodes um, one after another as behavior unfolds. And the first one I'm going to tell you about is the use of fMRI. Uh, and in particular, using um, multivoxel pattern analysis to try and look at the details of how information is represented in multiple demand regions. So this is the core idea of multivoxel pattern analysis, or MVPA. Um, you take a particular region of the brain. It might be one of the multiple demand regions. In fMRI, that will typically consist of perhaps a few hundred voxels, which are little measurement units of three by three by three, typically millimeters, so about the size of a peppercorn, 
and you can look at the activity, you can look at the pattern of activity across the voxels within that brain region. And in multivoxel pattern analysis, what you do is to ask in individual subjects whether the patterns for two cognitive events are different, are significantly different from one another. In other words, whether you can distinguish one from another. The idea being that if the patterns are significantly different at the level of voxels, then it must also be true that the patterns are different at neurons. In other words, at the level of neurons, that is, even though each voxel um, will contain a few million neurons, and so the signal will be very blurred, but if the patterns are different, then there must be component neurons that are also distinguishing those two cognitive events. In other words, that brain region is encoding that type of information. That's the sort of underlying thought. Um, and then what you would do to address the current question is to ask whether or not in the multiple demand system um, the contents of the current attentional episode are represented or distinguished, whereas other irrelevant information is not. And th various experiments have looked at that, but here's one, of, here's one attempt to prove that the multiple demand system as a whole codes task relevant, discards task irrelevant information. Um, in this experiment, it was a simple visual decision task where each little block of trials began with a cue, uh, in this case butterflies and cars, that tells the subject that for the next few trials they should be deciding whether each display contains a butterfly or a car. If it does, they press yes, and if it doesn't, they press no. Um, and in the context of a task of that sort, then they'll get a new cue later on telling them to do something different <laughs> in the next block. There are some distinctions between visual categories that are relevant, that matter, and there are some that are irrelevant, they don't matter at all to behavior. So for this block of trials, both butterflies and cars are targets. So it doesn't matter whether you're a butterfly or a car, from the point of view of this task, you have the same meaning. Um, fish and shoes are both, they're non-targets right now, so we call them N. We also call them inconsistent NI, because these are non-target categories that will be relevant on another block. And then finally, there are consistent non-targets, NC. Birds and sofas, for this subject, birds and sofas are never targets. So again, they're, they're non-targets in every block. So we can ask whether or not components of the multiple demand system distinguish two target categories that are very visually different but have the same behavioral meaning, or two target categories that are also visually different, but they're also different in terms of their relevance to the task. So you need to know this in order to control behavior. And I don't think I'm going to explain the data in detail, but essentially it's as you would predict, that throughout the multiple demand system, if you look at each of these regions separately, the difference between visual categories that's irrelevant to the task is not coded, so the patterns of activity are identical, so shall we say, for, um, for um, cars and butterflies in one block of trials, but the patterns are discriminable for, shall we say, butterflies and fish, which have different behavioral meaning. Um, so with fMRI to the level of resolution that you can get, it appears that the multiple demand system indeed does what an attentional system ought to do, that is to keep, to encode um, distinctions between cognitive events, stimuli or other cognitive events that are important for behavior and discard distinctions that are not. And you can see that much, much more clearly if you go down from the level of a voxel, which as I say, average is the signal in perhaps one or two million neurons to recording the activity of single neurons in behaving animals, um, usually behaving monkeys. Many experiments of this sort have been done. Some of them in our laboratory, I'm just going to illustrate with one version of this, of this type of experiment because again, I think they tend to give very similar results. In our experiment, a monkey was uh, given a, a, a series of trials which look like this. It always begins with a cue. This cue picture tells him which target he's looking for in a subsequent series of pictures. Uh, this cue means he's looking for the target, which is a little picture of a cat. I'm not sure if you can see it that well. So he sees the cue. He has to work out this means he's looking for the cat. If it had been another cue, he would have been looking for a different target. Wait, and then he watches through a series of pictures. When he finally sees his target, he waits until it turns off and then makes a response to its location and gets a reward. But the details of the task don't really matter, as in the first experiment, because what I'm about to say holds for almost any task that you give a monkey to do. So this is the style of experiments of this sort. You train an arbitrary task, one you happen to be interested in. You lower microelectrodes into a large region of frontal cortex. Here's a typical recording region for, uh, in the monkey's frontal lobe for two experimental subjects in this experiment until you encounter neurons. You don't select neurons on any functional grounds. You just randomly take anything that you hit. 
and you use these microelectrodes to record the activity of each neuron that you find. As I say, this is important that the um, sampling is random from this pretty large area that will include, um, I think it's fair to say, billions of cells, but you record just from a small sample of them. And now we're, th again, going to be asking whether patterns discriminate different cognitive events, such as the two cues or a target from a non-target. But now these patterns are defined across populations of recorded single cells, whereas before it was across voxels, each voxel consisting of, of one, one to two million cells. And from experiments of this sort, I'm just going to give a verbal summary of the, what I think is the big picture of the results. First, the density of the representation. If you record from this large area of the lateral frontal surface, and increasingly experiments are beginning to show the same from other putative multiple demand regions in the monkey cortex as well, then you find an extraordinary density of cells which appear to be doing what this task requires. Many, many, many cells which make the distinctions that are critical for the monkey's current behavior. Um, depending on your criterion for what would count as responding to significant events, it can be almost all of the cells. But even for quite fine distinctions, it's a lot. Here are two example cells. This shows the, activi um, uh, the activity of a cell in terms of spikes per second as a function of time from the onset of the queue at the beginning of the trial. And the, there are three different queues shown by different colors. And you find this cell obviously responds, shows sustained activity for one of the three cues, which indicates one possible target stimulus for the subsequent task, much less for the other two. And here's another cell which also shows strong queue encoding after the queue has been presented and while the monkey is waiting for the stream of stimuli to start. And in our experiment, we found around 30% of all cells in this large region of frontal cortex seem to show this selective response to the three different cues, even though these are completely arbitrary stimuli trained in a completely arbitrary task. That can only um, happen, of course, if this activity in this part of the brain is being shaped by the particular requirements of, the current, beha of current behavior. Uh, as I have said, attentional focus and relevance. What you find in experiments of this sort is that differences that matter are encoded. Differences that don't matter, such as two different non-target stimuli that are visually very different, but they're both non-targets on this trial. Very few cells encode the difference between the two. Um, the whole thing highly dynamic and programmable. As I say, the result only makes sense if you believe that, for example, this Q selectivity, this Q encoding, is actually created in these cells by the fact that the cues matter for behavior. And if you design experiments to prove that by having the monkey switch from one task to another, then you can confirm it's true that a given distinction is, ca is represented well in activity when it's relevant to behavior and then is discarded. Um, when it no longer matters. The attentional states, if you look at them in time, which you can do now with, um, with electrophysiology rather than fMRI, you can track the development of this encoding of task-relevant attended information over a period of a few hundred milliseconds as the task progresses. Um, yes, and here is sort of the basic conclusion that what the multiple demand system is doing is creating this sequence of attentional episodes, one after another, each one picking up the information that matters for current behavior, and very likely everybody believes this, me included, feeding back then to direct and focus attention in other, in other brain systems to make sure that everybody is working on what matters for the current thing that you're doing. I didn't explain this one, but this is just another example of even more common selectivity in our task. And now its activity of an example cell is plotted as a time function of time from presentation of a choice stimulus, not the cue, but the later choice stimuli in the sequence. Strong response to targets, no response at all to non-targets. Very common pattern. So you'll be happy to know that we have come to the end. Here are the overall, the overall conclusions. And I like the fact that it's been a dream um, since really well, not perhaps when I began work in psychology, because this dream didn't really exist at that point, but certainly for the last 25 years, that we would really be able to get converging lines of work at different levels of analysis, which would have something which would actually inform one another rather than just being on in parallel, going on in parallel. And for this problem, I think this is a, a pretty good candidate for how this can work. So beginning with Spearman's work, 1904, um, the idea that in fluid intelligence tests, you're measuring something of very general significance for all kinds of behavior. As I say, I would now suggest that what they're primarily measuring is this ability to take something relatively complicated, 
and divide it down into a sequence of simpler component, more solvable subproblems. Then you've got the multiple demand system, also important in solving many different problems, um, and presumably, as I mentioned at the same, not only focusing on, uh, on the content that matters for current behavior, but I strongly suggest encouraging everybody else in the brain also to focus on that, on that content, um, creating focused, coherent attentional episodes. Um, this, taught, this idea of, of solving complicated problems and breaking them into parts, as I said, it was worked out in beautiful detail in early logic solving problems by um, Alan Newell and, and um, Herbert Simon in the 1950s. And I, love, I like the fact that we now, the, this has been out of fashion for about probably 20 or 30 years since connectionism came around. But I think this symbolic AI, symbolic artificial intelligence, had an important insight about how we solve complex problems. And we're now getting to the point where this idea of artificial intelligence can be put together a bit more with biological intelligence in this um, idea of the multiple demand system, whose main role is indeed this process of sequential mental mental problem solving or reasoning. Reasoning, of course, typically is exactly that, of a series of steps that lead us from where we are to the conclusion that we would like to draw. Um, I've emphasized selective attention. And if you think about it, the concept of selective attention and the concept of abstraction are very closely related. Abstraction, again, since Goldstein in the 30s, has been thought of as being a core property of frontal lobe, uh, frontal lobe functions. Um, but what does abstraction mean except having a load of instances and throwing away all those differences between the instances that, are, that, are the, that don't matter for the current concept and just picking out the core of one particular thing that's shared across them. So I think in that sense, what we're talking about here is a me general mechanism for, for abstracting, uh, for an abstraction engine. And you, many, some of you may know this idea of a very famous paper by Lashley again in the early 50s, where he was introducing this problem of control of sequential behavior and was looking forward to the time when you might come up with a physiology of logic. And again, I think, obviously, we're very far away from that, but still, we're moving in the right direction. Um, I'd like to finish with some acknowledgments uh, in the fMRI study, uh, a, a couple of different ones that I showed you. The, the first study was done with Ev Fedorenko and Nancy Kamwisher at MIT, and Alex Woolgar and has also been very important in our fMRI, in our um, MVPA experiments. Neuropsychology, again, Alex Woolgar, Alice Parr, and a cast of thousands in assembling this group of 80 patients who um, I showed you the neuropsychological results from. The matrices have um, just been newly done by a summer student, Daphne Chalinski, and again, Danny Mitchell, and the electrophysiology, my collaborators in Oxford for the last um, 10 years or more. And I am through. Thank you very much for listening. So we have time for questions after this very stimulating talk. So I have a question at this point. Uh, it's a beautiful talk, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the role of subcortical structures in this sort of uh, general capacity, this gene mm -hmm. network. And do you see a role for subcortical structures, and what might they do in this sort of task? in these sorts of uh, general capacity, uh, providing general capacity? Um, well, the answers are successively yes, and I don't know. <laughs> so uh, it's certainly true if you uh, are just rather lazily focused on the cortical components of the multiple demand pattern here. But if you include subcortical regions in that same analysis, essentially averaging common act patterns of activity across many different cognitive demands, then you'll typically get something in the basal ganglia, which you should do because everybody knows the frontal lobe and basal ganglia are working together to solve, to solve problems. And usually something in the anterior part of the cerebellum as well, which again is not surprising given anatomical connectivity, but has just received much less attention by myself and everybody else in, in knowing what its contribution would be. So yes, I think, and of course, you know, there's never anything going on in the cortex that isn't also um, feeding through uh, or in involving interactions with thalamus of various nuclei, depending on the particular regions of the, of the cortex that you're working with. So I'm sure, yes, the correct answer is this should be thought of as a frontal and cortical, subcortical system, as a cortical and subcortical system. Um, 
as for different contributions of those components, then I really don't think I have very much to say. I have a bias, um, which is to think that it may not really be that easy to do functional segregation of, shall we say, basal ganglia and frontal cortex. I think it's probably much more true, and for thalamus and cortex, completely true, that they're, they're always working together in doing everything, and therefore it's not going to be possible at the cognitive level to say the basal ganglia does one cognitive function and the frontal cortex does another one. I really doubt that, but it's not something that I've got any data to speak to. Hi. Uh, your definition of intelligence, uh, as uh, uh, some of examples that you showed us, seems to me related a lot to deductive reasoning, but not so much to inductive reasoning. In the sense that, of course, in a deductive problem, if you decompose it, you can reach a solution. But uh, I'm not sure that you can say that uh, from a normative point of view to inductive, uh, when it comes to inductive problems. In those problems, uh, on the opposite, sometimes if you decompose them, you lose the picture and you don't get a solution. Mm. Most of our real life problems are inductive in nature and not deductive. So I was wondering if uh, you think that uh, you can extend these uh, to these uh, inductive problems and uh, I would say more real life problems. Mm. Um, yes, I think I agree with all of that though. Certainly I will say yes, I, you know, I think that the overall thought that to solve anything, whether it's you think of it as problem solving or you think of it as making yourself a cup of coffee, then you're going to have to find a way to find separate chunks within it that can be worked on. But, and in a way, this is the, this is the you might think the whole secret that I've said nothing about. They have to be the right chunks. So if you, it's of course certainly true that sometimes focusing at a micro level of something is losing where the real structure that allows you to come to the solution is, is at a macro level. Uh, and vice versa. And this is kind of the mystery. Uh, and is the mystery, of course, that Newell and Simon and everybody in Symbolic AI tried to work on, where they would state, give their programs any kind of problem, and the program, based on its analysis of what's in front of it and its compendious knowledge of the world it's working in, has to find structure within it where it actually moves forward towards a solution. But that general picture, I think, is... is um, applies to, to kind of any form of reasoning, certainly including induction. Um, and some of the subtests of fluid intelligence tests, like the culture fair that I showed there, are formally much more inductive. There'll be things like series completions. Um, I, I often myself think the distinction between induction and deduction isn't really that psychological in that, um, yeah, you know, it all depends what you take as being premises and givens and what you take as being just uh, what structure that you're, indeed, that you're for yourself deciding maybe the world has. But it's, uh, so I, I don't really think of them as being opposites in the way that many people do. Uh, very nice talk, John. Um, looking at your multiple demand system, it looks like it um, overlaps with what we, at one point in anatomy history we would have called association cortex and that it's also some of the areas looking at some of uh, Van Essen's data and so on that some of the areas that have shown cortical expansion through evolution and are the latest to come online in development do you have any um, thoughts on the multiple demand system in evolution and development um, not really so periodically um, I look at images of uh, people create of cortical expansion through primate evolution, for example, and try to persuade myself that it looks like the multiple demand system, and generally speaking, I fail. Uh, though it might look like parts of the multiple demand system plus a lot more. Usually there's a lot in the temporal lobe, for example, which is definitely not, in, it's definitely, um, not a multiple demand region. Um, yeah, so I think it's probably true that there is that these are sites of, of strong cortical expansion, but it's not true that they are. There's obvious agreement between those two. Another very similar question is whether or not there's agreement between this and the anatomical idea based on based on pathway tracing of a core core widely connected system, either based on pathway tracing in monkeys or based on functional connectivity in, in 
um, in humans. And again, I feel you can often blur your eyes and see, yes, there's some similarity, but not close enough that I feel like putting my stamp on it and saying that this is, this is an important part of the answer. So I'm not, I'm not sure, really. What, what relation do you see, uh, or what role you see for language and language development in shaping the, uh, the structure of the multiple demand system mm. within the single individual? Well, another lovely question, and what, another one, as in the case of most lovely questions, that I don't really know the answer to. Um, so Luria was very keen, from, with, taken from Vygotsky, I think, on the idea that language learning is one of the things that's very important in allowing the child to, as it were, take command of their cognition by being able to focus things based around the verbal symbol that then, that then is in itself a way of chunking, chunking knowledge up into component fragments, if you like. That seems right, and I don't know whether it's just a coincidence, but then when we, when we map the language selective and the multiple demand regions, they end up with this frontal and parietal components that are so close to one another. Is that just a fluke, or is it really true that we're looking in the language part in either a, a selection of a part of the system through development, which uh, in general is breaking things up into nice structured hierarchies, and this turns out to be something special, useful in language as well, or um, you know, is it just that, the, that they, things should be thought of as more dedicated from the start? Uh, again, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but I think developmentally, this is something, if I had another lifetime, I'd be planning on spending a lot of time on this, but now I'm just beginning to spend a small amount of time on it. The way that um, interactions with other adults, in particular, again, a Vygotskyan idea of scaffolding, of using language to direct the child to what matters in, and, and to problems they can solve right, when they're trying to do something bigger thing that they can't solve. It just seems to be such a strong element of how we do interact with children in that sense, are using language to build this um, cognitive structure of, 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 of goals and sub-goals, of, of wholes and parts. So it seems as if there should be something interesting to find out there. It's just that yeah, I don't have much, much more to say than, uh, than that at this point. Sorry, I forgot to respond about association cortex. Um, yes, of course. You know, I, I, I'm kind of uh, drawn to, to Fuster's ideas of the perceptual motor cycle, and essentially at the back of the brain, you've got a system that gradually starts with sensory systems and becomes more abstract and ends up in the inferior parietal cortex with the most abstract, most association-like. And in the front of the brain, you start at primary cortex and move forward, and it becomes gradually more abstract, and you end up in prefrontal cortex, and that those two are strongly speaking to one another to solve complex problems. So that's, that sounds about right to me, and, and, and fits those two components in the system, if you like. OK. So if there is no other question, uh, thank you very much again.